Welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. But he's put eternity in our hearts. It doesn't just speak to the unbeliever. And get this though, every person was made in the image of God. That image, of course, marred by sin. That's why even when we look in the mirror, we don't see glory, we see us. And, uh, but, but listen, he sees what we will be. If you're in Christ Jesus, he sees the finished product. Today, on our walk down the Calvary Road, we'll continue our overview of the Bible as we begin a study of Ecclesiastes, and we'll see that even the best life we could imagine without God is still not the best life for us. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Ecclesiastes. We continue our series, Jesus, from Genesis to Revelation, looking at Ecclesiastes, the title of our study, Eternity in Their Hearts. This is the second of the three books we have in Scripture written by Solomon, uniquely fit for this purpose as he was the wisest, richest, most powerful, and, well, most popular man of his day. And I can say with absolute assurance, none of us or any of those. None of us are the wisest. None of us are the richest. None of us are the most powerful, nor the most popular. So when he speaks to issues like finances, well, he knows what he's talking about. See, if I were to tell you, hey, money, you know, that will never make you happy. You'd look at me and say, you know, how do you know? And, and the same thing if you were to say to me, but when the richest man in the world says all the pursuit of all these things, apart from a right relationship with God will never bring satisfaction, well, we, we want to listen to him. He actually writes three books, Proverbs. We looked at last time, Song of Solomon. We'll look at next time. It's thought that he wrote Song of Solomon when he was young. You'll see why when you read it. And then that he wrote Proverbs during his, well, flourishing days as king of Israel, building the temple, doing all these amazing things. And then he writes Ecclesiastes later in his life after he'd stumbled a bit, and we'll get to look it into some of those things. Well, Proverbs, and by the way, he wrote 3,000 Proverbs. That's some serious writing. And still found time to write 1,005 songs. He built the temple. He built houses. He planted orchards. He planted vineyards. He, he worked in, in all sorts of agriculture. He worked with animals. This guy was just everywhere doing everything. And uh, so Solomon, in the Proverbs, we saw a wisdom that comes from a close personal walk with the Lord. And as long as he was listening to and learning from and walking with the Lord, Solomon found joy in everything he did. Ecclesiastes, it, it reveals the frustration and futility of man's activities and experiences apart from that close, intimate walk with the Lord. So the same guy who, who when God said, ask anything you want, said, I just need wisdom from you. I, I need to know the difference between right and wrong. I, I'm going to lead this great people of yours. I need insight and understanding. God grants him that, makes him rich, makes him powerful, makes him all the other things he was. And for a season, it was all good. And then, well, little chinks in the armor here and there, and we'll see where all of that leads. Well, all we see, all we experience, all we attempt, all we accomplish, we'll find to be ultimately, well, he calls it vanity or futility, frustrating. There, there's a lot of ways to look at it, but, but basically what it comes down to is if God's leading and blessing, it's all good. And if God's not leading or blessing, then all our attempts to get and to accomplish and to become, well, they will lead to um, some sort of frustration and, uh, and well, all the problems that come with it. Well, like the Psalms, last thing I have to say in the way of introduction, 
like the Psalms that Ecclesiastes reveals man's view of his situation. And then somewhere along the line, we'll switch over and we'll see God's view. So we're going to get to see what life looked like to Solomon after all he'd experienced. And he was looking back on his life and he's saying, you know, looking back and looking around, I'm just not sure. And then there'll be a revelation from heaven where he gets some clarity. And and if you read the book and you're like, wow, he sounds bipolar or something. He's all up and then he's down and, and then he's, you know, all excited and then he's all frustrated. Listen, it's important to see it. He was struggling because he'd walked away from the Lord who had so blessed him. But the Lord kept tugging at him and kept trying to speak to him. So so like David would begin his and David Solomon's dad, right? He would begin some of those Psalms in despair and he'd end up delighting in the Lord. Why? Because he was looking at his situation, his circumstances, his failure, And then all of a sudden he looks up and he realizes, but you're still on the throne. You're still the God of Israel. It's sort of like what happens after every election. We're like, oh my gosh, what's happened? And then we're like, oh, but you're still on the throne. It's all going to be okay. Well, we're going to see that today as well. Solomon will state a proposition. He'll support it with observations and illustrations, and then he'll correct it as God gives him wisdom again from heaven, a revelation from the throne of God. Here in chapter one, the first couple verses, Solomon introduces himself as the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. And he states his first proposition here in verse two. And if you have your Bibles, you should be reading along. We're gonna look at seven of the the passages where he's addressing major issues. And so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll summarize some for time's sake, and then we'll look together at as many as we can for um, to hear it and to see it. It just does something wonderful in us. Well, his first proposition is this. It's there in verse two. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Sounds like he's a little down. He could use someone to come and put his arm around him and say, hey, come on, bro, everything's going to be okay. He is looking at life as, well, we're apt to do. Seeing it from from all of the failures and frustrations and all the difficulties and and all of the injustice and all the oppression and, and all the things that were going on. But he wasn't focusing on the one who can make all those things right, who promises all things will work together for good to those who are called according to God's purpose, those who love God and are called according to his purposes. So uh, his, his summary of this particular section will be this, and we'll look at a couple verses in it, but that all man's labor ends in death. The stats are astonishing. One out of one dies, 100 out of 100, 1,000 out of 1,000. He says, all things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. He's just saying neither the eye nor the ear will ever get enough to be satisfied. And I immediately think of the beach because it doesn't matter how many times I've been there or how many hours I've sat there or walked there. The, the, the look, the sound, the smell, the everything about the beach says, come back, come back. I never get enough. And, and listen, the beach is actually a good thing, but, but not everything's good. And so what we set our eyes on and we set our ears to and what we set our heart on, it will never satisfy us. I got to say, Solomon is so ahead of the curve. He's the one who'll say there's nothing new under the sun. And and listen, he's he's the first one to ever sing, I can't get no satisfaction. (laughs) Neither the eye nor the ear. Verse 14, take a peek at it. It says here, I have seen all the works that are done under the sun. And indeed, all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Yeah. What we strive to gain slips through our fingers. He paints a picture for us with his words. And I so love his writing. 
It's grasping for the wind. It's impossible, we know. And then look at verses 17 and 18, and then we'll jump into chapter two. Verses 17 and 18, as he kind of gets to the heart of this, he said, I set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. And I perceive that this also is grasping for the wind, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. By the way, those aren't actually words of despair. They're just a fact. Jesus himself, a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief. That's in spite of of all he knew and who he was and what he came to do. He sorrowed and grieved over the suffering of people around him. And there's something about maturing and, and understanding what's really happening that can lead to a bit of discouragement. Lord, how will this world ever be what you intend it to be? Well, we can't change the world. I don't want to, you know, burst your bubble if that's what you're out to do. Uh, You know, go for it, but just know this. If you can just change yourself, you know, connect with God and surrender. Let him have his way and then impact your family positively and then spill over into the fellowship and into your neighborhood into the community, you will be changing the world in the best possible way, organically from the inside out, one person at a time. That's how the world changes, not by the next election or not by the next big thing. Well, his pursuit then of wisdom and knowledge led to grief. It led to sorrow. And then he gets into some eye problems where 10 times in a row, he'll say, I or me, or myself, you know, it's the unholy trinity, me, myself, and I. And as he looks at life through the lens of himself, well, things aren't all that great. He'll deal with amusements and pleasure and laughter. He says, man, I I had the best wine and I planted vineyards and orchards. I was rich. I was powerful. And, And then And in verses 13 and 14, chapter two, take a peek with me. This is a revelation because he's been saying all my amusements, all my pleasure, all my laughter, all of this, it all left me empty. But here's a revelation. I saw, he says, and this just means that God's still speaking to him. I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. But wise and the fool, well, the same things happen to both. He says, the wise man's eyes are in his head. The fool walks in darkness, but I perceive the same event happens to them all. Now, he's not saying that wisdom isn't better than foolishness. Of course it is. And he's not saying light isn't better than darkness. He's just saying, if you're merely observing from a human plane, Hey, the end result is the same. You're wise and you die and you're foolish and you die. But what you leave behind matters. And that's really the perspective he's going to gain from the the Lord. He's saying in verses 17 through 23, all we leave, all we labor for, uh, we leave it all behind. To, To one who may be wise or may be foolish, but he certainly hasn't labored for it or earned it, nor does he or she deserve it. Well, that's sort of like God's grace, isn't it? We don't earn it. We don't deserve it, but he just lavishes it upon us. The second revelation from heaven in this particular section, there in verses 24 to verse 26, he says, nothing is better for a man that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. It's a reminder that God made us for a relationship with him. And he made us for relationships with one another. And that real joy at the end of the day is is doing your best to enjoy the work he set you to. And then enjoying the relationships you have in the evening as you sit down to a meal, you fellowship with your family. He's saying, this is what life is really about. After all that other radical stuff he did, He's saying a meal with family and friends after a hard day's work, that's meaningful. 
that's fruitful. Well, chapter three is the key to this whole book because as he goes back and forth from life's full of vanity to, well, life has real purpose, life's full of futility to, well, God knows what he's doing. In chapter three, he's going to show us by giving us 14 couplets covering the whole range of activity from birth to death everything in between, that God has a time, that God has a purpose for every activity under heaven. And that means this, nothing in life is meaningless. Nothing is completely futile. And, and, and so look at it with me, read along as we just look at this, not going to do a lot of commentary on it. That'll happen a few times in this study because the things I say may or may not help you. The things God says absolutely are going to benefit you to everything. He says there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Lord, show us what time it is. That's my prayer today. Teach us the number our days that will have a heart of understanding. Well, in verse 9, he asked the question, what profit has the worker from that in which he labors. Verse 10, he says, I've seen the God-given task which, with, with which the sons of men are occupied. And in verse 11, well, he answers the question and of verse nine, he's made everything beautiful in its time. This is an Old Testament, Romans 8, 28, right? All things working together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purposes. He makes everything beautiful in his time. So when you're in the middle of a mess, you can say, Lord, I don't know how you make something beautiful of this, but you say you will and you'll do it in your time. So you can rest, you can trust, you can find peace in the midst of whatever it is you find yourself going through. Not only has he made everything beautiful in its time, he says also he has put eternity in their hearts. I titled this study Eternity in Their Hearts for this reason. If you're not yet a believer in Christ, the fact that you're here means this. He is drawing you to him. And, uh, you know, I've shared that in the past and I've had a student come up after and, and, and tell me, I just want you to know that wasn't the case for me. My teacher assigned me to come and take notes on your sermon. And I'm like, well, that's awesome. Who's your teacher? You know, thinking, well, maybe one of the Christians who goes here is doing that. No, it was some teacher that doesn't believe, but just thought it would be good for kids to hear what pastors are saying so they know what nutcases we are. But you know that the reality is that that person heard a lot of truth because that's what gets shared when you're reading the word and sharing the word. And so let me say, if you don't know the Lord, well, he loves you and he's drawing you. He sent the son to suffer and die on Calvary's cross for your sins. And he paid the price so you could have life, life eternal in him life abundant in him, but he's put eternity in our hearts. It doesn't just speak to the unbeliever and get this though. Every person was made in the image of God. That image, of course, marred by sin. That's why even when we look in the mirror, we don't see glory. We see us. And, uh, but, but listen, he sees what we will be. If you're in Christ Jesus, he sees the finished product. And I know for sure what I'm going to be like when I stand before Jesus in glory. I will be like him. That's what he says. Just like Jesus, perfected in every way. And so for us, it's, it's just so important to see it. We were created in his image and he stamped eternity on our hearts. So when we find ourselves in a time of suffering or struggling or sinning, whatever it might be, that tug from within, not just someone preaching at us 
or, or, or trying to direct us from outside, but, but God working from the inside out. He's saying, man, think of this situation, see this circumstance in the light of eternity, and it will just lift you above and beyond all you're going through. And you'll just end up saying, God, you are so good, even in the midst of whatever it is you're enduring. Well, the bottom line here is he's telling us the knowledge of and a right relationship with God, it provides meaning. When we realize we were made by him and for him, we were created to know him and to make him known. That's meaning for our life and purpose. Our heart devises our way. The Lord directs our steps. Joy in your presence, fullness of joy. And then peace with God, peace within, peace with one another. We'll look at chapter three, verse 12, because I set my heart to teach you or at least share most of this with you. He says, again, I know that nothing's better than for them to rejoice and do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. Does that sound like depression or does that sound like revelation? I want to say he's got his focus right off of his failure and on to the one who never fails us. Well, he returns to what we all observe and the sad conclusion many end up coming to. His observation in verse 19, what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them. As one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust and all return to dust. Can I say that's not a completely inspired statement? Although he was the wisest man of his day, he didn't have all knowledge. And what he's saying, though, observing, and this is the same thing men do today. They're observing the same evidence we're looking at. God says creation testifies I am. And they're, they're saying creation doesn't need a God. I mean, everything could just appear and happen. Well, I, I guess, no, I don't guess that. That's not possible. And, and, and so here, here's the point. Those who don't know the Lord... And he's just speaking here as one who would look around who doesn't know any difference and say, well, look at animals live and they die. When he says they all have the same breath, he's just saying we all have bad breath. And uh, but but no, what he's saying is, is that, you know, you breathe your last and then you're dead. That's true for an animal. That's true for a human. But the, the problem is there's no revelation from God in here. But then he gets one. Remember, I said he goes from what man can observe and the conclusions men make based on what he observes. To, to what God reveals, look at verse 21. Who knows the spirit of the sons of men, which goes upward and the spirit of the animal, which goes down to the earth? Who knows? God knows. And the fact that he could go from saying, hey, look at everybody can see this, but here's what, here's what not everybody knows, that the spirit of man ascends. The, the spirit of animals descend. Then he said, I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for that is his heritage. How many times does he say, enjoy your work? And yet if you pull people today and you're like, how happy are you in your job? You know, from, from just one to five, five being extremely happy and one being completely miserable. They're like, is there anything below one? Because that's me, you see. And he's saying, look, this is our heritage. Rejoice in our works. Who can bring him to see what will happen after him? We don't know what's coming next. But if you're in Christ Jesus, you do know this. It's way better than what we're experiencing now. Solomon, like Job, is getting this. I know my Redeemer lives. And in the last day, he will stand upon the earth. And after the worms destroy my body, he says, in, in my flesh, I will see God. And with my eyes, I will behold him and not another. Only God can fully know what lies ahead, but we can at least be sure of our future in heaven. And for now, we can walk with him day by day, content in his grace. We're so glad you could join us today on the Calvary Road. 
Listen in tomorrow as we finish our study of Ecclesiastes and consider the mortality of humanity and the joy of walking with God both now and forever. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico. You can visit our website at ccchico.com or download the CC Chico app to connect with us and find more from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to the Calvary Road podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We hope to hear from you soon, and until next time, may God bless your walk down the Calvary Road. And your grace.